Well, hi there, and welcome once again to In Search of Christianity, brought to you by Bible Talk. And once again, we are in upstate New York at Dryden, here at the home of Bob and Pam Rizzoni. A blessing to be here, Amen. a blessing for them to be able to join us, and a blessing for you to be able to join with us. Yeah. We just, uh, it's not face-to-face -face like I would like it to be, but we'll take what we yes. can get. So hallelujah, we're continuing on in our study of In Search of Christianity, trying to find true biblical faith. So we're not acting, living, walking according to the traditions of men or the tradition of the elders, but by led by the Word of God. I mean, God has given us His Word to lead us. And that's the purpose of this study, is to seek that out, find it, and then once we find it, then you got to live it. Hallelujah. Yeah. So we're going to continue on. This is, I believe, our 24th Fourth. week yeah. in, the, in this program. And before we start, I'm going to ask Brother Bob if you would just ask God's blessing upon our time together. Father, we just thank you that you love us, and that you care for us, and that you speak to us, yes. and that you desire for us to be like Christ Jesus. And Father, we ask that you would impart to us wisdom. And Father, we thank you for this evening. We ask you to bless it in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Well, I know we have brothers and sisters who uh, participate and watch this from many, many different places in this world. And I'm sure that if you've been awake, at least throughout the day, you've noticed that these are very complex times, very troubled times. But the simple fact of the matter is, there are simple answers. There are simple truths for these complex times. And that's kind of what I want to get into in this program today. We've been talking a lot about the difference between religion and relationship. Mm -hmm. Okay. And, and I've said it many times, I'm going to say it one more time. Jesus Christ did not come into this world, was not born in Bethlehem to, to start a new religion, but to restore an old relationship, to restore us to the Father. I, I did a study sometime back in England about Jesus the repairer. Mm -hmm. yes. And, you know, he was a carpenter. He could repair. You bring it into his shop, he'd repair it. He'd do it good. Because he would do it as unto his father. Mm -hmm. But to think about that word, to repair. He was repairing us. Mm -hmm. Bringing us back into that right union, right relationship with God the Father. That's the reason he came into the world. Mm -hmm. To repair okay. us. Okay. So many people find religion so complex. Not just the world situation. And such a burden, quite frankly. But think about this, this simple truth. Jesus said in Matthew 11, he said, Come to me, all who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. My, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. It's, it's a shame as we travel around to see how many people are burdened by the religious obligations that are placed upon them. You know, most of the New Testament, if you read the letters, they are about a proper perspective of the law. Correct. Okay? That we can't be saved by the law. We are, we are saved by the free gift of God. And the law is there for our instruction, but you have to look at it in the spirit rather than in the natural. Because there were so many laws and they were such a burden to the people of Israel. You know how many laws there were? 613. 613 Levitical laws. And now, it, for, it says it was for, for freedom that Christ set us free. Where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. And now, in much of the Christian church, there are 1,752 canon laws. Almost three times. Something is wrong with this picture. Okay? Jesus came and he said, my burden's not heavy. I mean, you know, it's... We have to find that. So it's, it says in Colossians, Paul wrote in Colossians, I'm reading from chapter 2, verses 20 to 23. If you have died with Christ to the elementary principles of the world, why, as if you were living in the world, do you submit yourself to decrees, such as do not handle, do not taste, do not touch, 
which all refer to things destined to perish, perish with use, in accordance with the commandments and teaching of men. These are matters which have, to be sure, the appearance of wisdom in self-made religion and self-abasement and severe treatment of the body, but are of no value against fleshly indulgence. It seems like religion has placed all these obligations, all these burdens. Don't do this, don't do this. Do the... It's not from God. No. I mean, and how much more clear can it be than what he writes, right? But then Paul goes on to say, in, or, um, excuse James. me, James. James says after Paul, but prove yourself doers of the word and not merely hearers who delude themselves. Right? I, I thank God that we're gathered to hear God's word. But hearing is not enough. You've got to be doers, all right? And he goes on to say, But one who looks intently at the perfect law, the law of liberty, and abides by it, not having become a forgetful hearer, but an effectual doer, this man will be blessed in what he does. If anyone thinks himself to be religious, and yet does not bridle his tongue, but deceives his own heart, this man's religion is worthless. Pure and undefiled religion in the sight of our God and Father is this, to visit orphans and widows in their distress and keep oneself unstained by the world. Mm -hmm. James 1, I read verses 22, 25 through 27. Religion is about man's connection and interaction with man. Righteousness is about our relationship with God the Father. Okay? And that's only made possible through Jesus Christ, his atoning work on the cross, empowered by the Holy Spirit. That's where righteousness comes from. It doesn't come from all of the quote-unquote works that religion... So now I want to look at this and find, you know, what should we be doing as far as our spirituality and the religion, okay? Well, we know that the works that we're supposed to be doing, as Jesus told us, is to believe on him. Whom the Father sent, the Father yes. Sent so that's one of the things. <laughs> yes, okay. This is, okay. Now I'm, what I'm saying is, okay, let me go on because I'll tell you what I just Okay. Peter wrote, 2 Peter 1 3, and he said, speaking of God, he says, His divine power has granted to us everything pertaining to life and godliness through the true knowledge of Him who called us by His own glory and excellence. All right? So, speaking of the scriptures, for whatever was written in early times was written for our instruction, right? Mm -hmm. Think of this. It's not a secret. Correct. It's not a secret. Correct. I'm going to read you something. Correct. All right? I'm going to read you from the prophet Micah, Old Testament. Micah 6, verse 8. He has told you, O man, what is good. Yes. And what does the Lord require of you? See that? He's told us. He's told us. But do justice to love kindness and to walk humbly with your God. That's what God requires. And if you look at the verses prior to that, he's talking about, it's not about the, the, the offerings. It's not about the burnt offerings. It's not about the fat of rams. It's about this. This is what it says. He has told you, O oh man, what is good. Here's what he wants. Do justice, love kindness, and walk humbly with your God. I want to look at those three things because this is the instruction. This is what he has told us, right? Mm -hmm. To do justice. Now, I don't think that that translation does justice with the term do justice. Okay. Okay. Could you elaborate? Yeah. Is that circular reasoning? <laughs> <laughs> the reason for that is the Hebrew word that's used there and is, and I, I'm, I'm going to read you now from a definition in Strong, right? It's a verdict, favorable or unfavorable, pronounced judiciously. And I think I had mentioned in other studies how God has a legal system. You know, he's called mountains to, to, to bear witness against us and everything, right? In the King James, that's translated do justly. In the English Standard, it's called do justice. And in the Young's Literal, it says do judgment. Okay? But here's the deal. When you understand this, if it's if it is a, a like a legal judgment, what it requires is an appraisal. 
when you have a trial to test something, you test it against something, right? Mm -hmm. Think of what Paul wrote to the Corinthians, 1 Corinthians 2.14, he says, But a natural man does not accept the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness to him. And he cannot understand them because they are spiritually appraised. But he who is spiritual appraises all things, yet he himself is appraised by no one. Appraise, this, and the King James translates it this way a number of times, is to discern. Okay? And that, and that same thing, all right? In, in 1 Corinthians, it's, it's translated judge and it's translated discern. Where here it's translated appraise. Right? We have been given discernment. Okay? I'm going to read again from, I'm going to, this is a Bible study, so don't be surprised, I give you the Bible. Hebrews 5, 11 through 14. Concerning him, talking about Jesus, we have much to say. I got a lot to say. Hallelujah. And it is hard to explain since you have become dull of hearing. Now, this is the writer of Hebrews writing to the people of God and saying, you become dull of hearing. That's the problem. The word hasn't changed. Jesus saying, come to me, all of you who are weary, that hasn't changed. But when we become dull of hearing God's word, it becomes a burden. He says, for though by this time you ought to be teachers, you have need again for someone to teach you the elementary principles of the oracles of God. And you have come to need milk and not solid food. Talking about the word. For everyone who partakes only of milk is not accustomed to the word of righteousness, for he is an infant. But the solid food is for the mature, who because of practice have their senses trained to discern good and evil. God desires, should I say demands, that we have a biblical world view and see all things through the lens of God's word. That's the truth. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay? And understand. Everything that we look at, we should be appraising. That's what it says. Mm -hmm. But we appraise it by God's word. That's called a biblical worldview. You're looking at the news. Are you thinking about God's word when you look at the news? When you hear about this going on and that going on? If you're not, you, you, you have become dull of hearing. A, a recent Focus on the Family article quoted Barna, Barna the Barna Research Organization. And I just want to read this to you. A recent nationwide survey completed by Barna Research Group determined that only 4% of Americans had a biblical worldview. 4%. When George Barna, who has researched cultural trends in the Christian church since 1984, looked at the born-again believers in America, the results jumped sky high to 9%. That wasn't a direct quote. Were, the results were a dismal 9%. Mm -hmm. Scary. Barna's survey also connected an individual's worldview with his or her moral beliefs and actions. It's true, it can't be otherwise. Yes. Barna says, although most people own a Bible and know some of its content, our research found that most Americans have little idea how to integrate core biblical principles to form a unified, meaningful response to the challenges and opportunities of life. Absolutely. If you are not, listen, if you're not living the Word of God, you're ineffectual. That's what it says. And you are missing the blessings of God. You are missing the abundant, joy-filled life that Jesus came to give you. And what you are living, at best, is that religious life that isn't going to do you much good at all. Okay. So, in other words, and this is, I mean, this should be clear to all of us. The Lord has given us his word to guide us. From your precepts, I get understanding. Therefore, I hate every false way. Your word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. I have sworn and I, sworn and I will confirm it, that I will keep your righteous ordinances. Psalm 119, verses 104 to 106. Everybody knows that 105, you know. But that's it. God's given us a light. In the, to get us through this darkness, the darkness of this world. And it's called His Word. It just isn't happening. People aren't living according to His Word. 
Okay, let's go on to the next one. Love kindness, right? Mm -hmm. Right? First one was justice. Next one was love kindness. That word, I can remember when I went to the seminary. I did graduate work in a mainline seminary. God protected me. Hallelujah. <laughs> but I, I remember because I had a, a, a professor who truly was, I mean, one of the most knowledgeable people about the Hebrew language that I ever met. And he, I can remember he and I sitting and having a conversation with this very verse. And, you know, uh, and one, uh, one that is a, very much like it in Hosea. That kindness is a steadfast attribute. And it's translated 30 times as loving kindness. Mm -hmm. But it, the King James calls it love mercy, but it also 30 times calls it loving kindness. The English Standard calls it love kindness. The Young's Literal calls it the same thing. But listen to this from Vine's Expository Dictionary of the Old Testament. Mm -hmm. In general, one may identify three basic meanings of the word. The word, the Hebrew word is chesed, okay? Which always interacts strength, steadfastness, and love. Those are the three qualities that are wrapped in that word, right? Strength, steadfastness, and love. And he goes on to say any understanding of the word that fails to suggest all three in, in, inevitably loses some of its richness. You know, it says in Lamentations 3.22, the Lord's love and kindness indeed never cease, for his compassions never fail. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. Amen. That kindness is the one that is the fruit of the Holy Spirit, yes. Galatians 5.22. Mm -hmm. And that's what's supposed to be in us, this steadfast love. Think about it. I want to reduce Christianity to its simplest form. A scribe came to Jesus and said, what commandment is foremost of all? And Jesus answered, The foremost is, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. And you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and with all your strength. Mark 12, 29 and 30. That's Christianity. He continued on and he said, And the second is this, You shall love your neighbor as yourself. There is no other commandment greater than these. That's what Jesus said. Mm -hmm. This is what James calls the royal law. It's the royal law of love, James 2a. And everything is wrapped up in that. All right? Jesus summed it up in this way. A new commandment I give to you, that you love one another even as I have loved you, that you also love one another. John 13, 34. Well, how did he love us? He gave himself up an offering. He, he, totally. he, didn't, he didn't give some. He gave all. That's right. You know, years ago, we were out, I was doing a Bible study at the, uh, a house group in Lyon in France. Mm -hmm. And it was with these Africans who would all come mm -hmm. there to, to try and find work to send funds back to support their families in Africa. And we were going on and on. And it was a good-sized group. Mm -hmm. I, and I don't remember how this came to be. But in the midst of this, one of the fellows said to me, why doesn't the church in America do more to help us? These were people in need. Yes. I mean, they came there and they were still struggling, struggling, struggling. <clears throat> and his question caught, kind of caught me off guard. Why doesn't America, why isn't the church here with all of our abundance, why don't we do more to help them? And I stopped and I thought, and my immediate reaction was, well, we don't care. But you know, the Word of God says, be slow to speak. I can be quick to hear, right? So I said, I repent. I said, that's not the correct answer. The correct answer is because we don't care enough. And that is the truth. And what's enough? So I went home that night, or this, to this little hotel we were staying at, and I had a long, long conversation with the Lord because it struck me, okay, what's enough? Mm -hmm. Sure. If, if I make a statement like we don't love enough, so... I was having this conversation with the Lord, and it's like, I, I don't know how to explain this. It's sometimes it's like he's just sitting there smiling at me, waiting for me to, to get it. Mm -hmm. And my mind flashed back to, to verses that I truly, truly love in Philippians, where it says, we're to have the same mind in us that was in Christ Jesus. And it says, not considering being equal with God, a thing to be grasped. It says, he emptied himself. 
And and when I kind of recounted that verse before the Lord, he said, you haven't given all. And if you haven't given all, we have not loved as Jesus loved. I mean, it's like we're always holding in reserve. And if we give a lot, we, we feel so proud of ourselves. Yeah. Knocks it right out. <laughs> he gave it all. That's what it means to love one another. Yes. That there's nothing in reserve. Okay? Is that tough? You see, and I want to tell you that the Greek of that verse, a new commandment I give you, would make it much more clear that it's not a new command. It's a fresh understanding of what's been there all along. Okay? This, this is a fresh understanding of what the Lord spoke to Moses on the mountain when he gave him the commands. There's nothing new. Mm -hmm. Jesus, it's amazing. I, my favorite thing is the Sermon on the Mount. There's so little that is new in the Sermon on the Mount, except for the understanding of it. Okay? Christianity, true Christianity, is not about coming to the Lord with burnt offerings. It says that in Micah 6.6. 6. Mm -hmm. Or as King David, a man after God's own heart, here's what he said. Sacrifice and meal offering you have not desired. My ears you have opened. Burnt <clears throat> offering and sin offering you have not required. That's Psalm 40. This is Old Testament. Sure. I mean, you know, this is not something Jesus came and changed everything. He was giving us, a, or he was either calling to mind what was already there. It was the religious leaders that made everything about the rules and regulations. But it was never about that in the eyes of God. Think about it. I know you know these verses. Well, maybe I shouldn't make that assumption. The Apostle Paul, of all people in the New Testament, was most expert on the law. Right? Yes, mm -hmm. he was. And yet what he said was that he had determined to know nothing but Christ and him crucified. Amen. I want to tell you how he put that another way when he wrote to the Corinthians. In 1 Corinthians 13, if I speak with the tongues of men and of angels, but do not have love, I become a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. If I have the gift of prophecy and know all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have all faith so as to remove mountains, but do not have love, I'm nothing. If I give all my possessions to feed the poor, and if I surrender my body to be burned, but do not have love, it profits me nothing. True faith, true faith, faith-driven Christianity. I remember I said that when we started this thing, it was the title is In Search of Christianity. We are looking for, we are seeking true biblical faith in these perilous last days. Can be summed up in one word. <clears throat> love. It's about love. It's not about going to the church on Sunday. It's not about a holy day of obligation. It's not about fasting or anything. It's not about this. It's not about, it's about love. First of all, love for God, and then love for your fellow man, right? Okay, that leads us to one last thing. Walk humbly with your God. It says in Psalm 25, he leads the humble in justice, and he teaches the humble his way. It says in Psalm 37, 11, but the humble will inherit the land and will delight themselves in abundant prosperity. Does that connect to something you've heard before? Jesus said, blessed are the meek, the humble, for they shall inherit the earth. Matthew 5, 5. It's all there. From Genesis 1 to Revelation 22, God is not a man that he should change. Mm -hmm. Jesus Christ, it says in Hebrews 30, is the same yesterday, today, and yes, forever. If you do not walk humbly with your God, you will not walk at all with your God. It was always the plan, and it was always the reality. We can see this in the original plan in the Garden of Eden. All right? In the Garden, wasn't the Lord there? When he, he was watching, he was walking. It says he walked in the cool of the day. You know what probably the time that, what happens? There was one time he's walking in the Garden, and he's calling out, Adam, where are you? Now, the Lord has said to us that he will never leave us nor forsake us. When Adam sinned, they went and hid from God and separated them from God. He wasn't walking with God, humbly or otherwise. He was hiding from God. Sin will do that to you. 
The one thing that I know brings about true humility in the life of a believer is being conscious of God's awesome presence. You're not going to do wrong when you are conscious of His awesome presence right with you right now. When you sin, you're hiding from God. you got to do it. Think about it. It's about the presence of God that brings humility. David said in Psalm 23, Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I shall fear no evil, for thou art with me. It was about the presence of God. The Lord said to Paul in the night by a vision, Do not be afraid any longer, but go on speaking and do not be silent, for I am with you. It was about the presence of God. Jesus on the cross. Jesus crying out with a loud voice said, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. Luke 23, 46. What all of these have in common is an understanding that they are helpless unto themselves. They are. Even Jesus, who humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross, as it says in Philippians 2.8, totally and completely surrendered to and dependent to the love of the Father. That's humility. When you have no faith, no trust in your own strength, but you have to trust in God, you trust in His presence. I started by saying this is about discernment. It is about God gave us senses, and the purpose of the senses was that we would be aware, conscious of His presence. He gave us eyes that we could fix on Jesus Christ. He gave us ears so we could hear His voice. He gave us uh, nostrils so we could smell that sweet aroma of His presence. He gave us a tongue so that we could taste and see that the Lord is good. He gave us hands to, to feel, to reach out and touch the hem of His garment. God wants us to be conscious of His presence because that's all He desires is to walk with us, that we would walk humbly with Him. Because when you do that, I promise you, you will love justice. You will appraise things spiritually. I promise you that that will be the case of your life. We need to surrender. We were talking about this before. So many people sing the song, I surrender all, and never do. No, no I, I may never do, but I'm, it's about trying. It's about the desire of your heart, because God searches the heart. He hears the words, and you're responsible for the words that come out of your mouth. But God searches your heart. Can you sing that song, I Surrender All, where all of your trust, all of your faith is in His ability, none of your own? If you're trusting in yourself any way at all, you're not living this life. So, Father, I just pray, Lord God, I thank you, Lord God, that you have given us your Holy Spirit, that you have made us a temple of your Holy Spirit, that we do have the ability, Lord, to surrender our will to you, to your love for us, trusting in your love for us. Lord, help us to be make that the evidence of our lives. Because it is the fruit of the Holy Spirit. And you said people would know us by their, our fruit. And they would know us by our love one for another. Help us, Lord God, by the power of your Spirit to truly, as your Sunday, to love one another. That's my prayer, Father. Well, hallelujah. Another half hour. Zoometh by. That was King James. Zoometh. Zoometh by. I trust and I pray that you'll be with us for the next time, next week. If you got blessed, write to us at office at BibleTalk.com and let us know. We'd love to hear from you, and we'd love to write back to you. God bless you, and goodbye. On a hill far away Stood an old rugged cross The emblem of suffering and shame But I love that old cross Where the dearest and best For a world of lost sinners